Hi, this is John Harcher, and welcome to episode 6.5 of Left Turn at Albuquerque. Yep, we're doing a bonus episode for the bonus disc on this one, too. There's a lot more to talk about on here than I originally thought, so let's get to it. I knew I should have made a left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I should have turned left at Albuquerque. Now, as previously mentioned, Disc 3 is a Blu-ray exclusive. Yet again, in standard definition, go figure. And it really shows. Now, since Tex Avery has a set of discs all his own, I'll just mention what's included here, and then somewhere down the line we'll do those discs. Uh, but before we get to those, there's a long list of documentaries. First is King Size Comedy, Tex Avery, and the Looney Tunes Revolution. It was a new-to-this-disc documentary on the legendary toon director and a pretty long one, over 40 minutes. Next is Tex Avery, King of the Cartoons. Wait, another one for Tex? Well, he's worth it. This one is a 1988 special. I believe it was on TNT. Believe it or not, it covers different ground than the previous special. It's, uh, it's also funny seeing frequent collection contributor Mark Hauser back then his mustache still hasn't changed. And remember the stripper modeling session from Cross Country Detours? It's here. The great thing about having Warners and MGM under one roof is you can get the bulk of his work in one place. Only the later Universal tunes in his career are missing. Frizz on Film Follows. It's a similar type special recapping Frizz's career that was included on the 2006 Golden Collection. It's still funny hearing how he was the whipping boy of the Kansas City cartoonist crowd, which included Hugh Harmon, Rudolph Ising, of Iwerks, and some guy named Disney. Now, they've mentioned it on many of the documentaries through the years, but I haven't brought it up yet. The main purpose of the Merry Melodies was to sell Warner's sheet music. That's why they always included all those songs. Now, here's one more interesting tidbit. When Frizz went over to MGM, it went so badly, he ran back to Warner Brothers the minute his contract was up. The co-director in his unit also got demoted. His name, William Hanna. He got put at a desk next to a new guy named Joe Barbera, and they were given the task of creating a series about a cat and mouse. Fair to say, things worked out all around. Next up is Toon Heads, The Lost Cartoons from the Cartoon Network show of years past that was also included on Golden Collection Volume 1. Many of the tunes featured in the show are either included as extras on this disc or turned up on later collections, but here's an odd one. Their very first Merry Melody, Lady Play Your Mandolin, is not included on any collection as a separate tune, Shades of a Wild Hair, but is on the Little Caesar DVD Blu-ray, of all things. You'd think it would have been included somewhere along the way as its own, but guess they haven't been able to restore it yet. Maybe someday. They had several episodes of the series focusing on tunes that aren't often shown. They also had one on the war tunes. Speaking of, the next documentary up is Real American Zero, The Adventures of Private Snafu. This was the Behind the Tunes documentary from Volume 5. It's still astonishing to think you had Frank Capra, Chuck Jones, Bob Clampett, Frank Tashlin, and Dr. Seuss all working on one series. The last documentary is The World of Leon Schlesinger. Jerry Beck hosts a collection of odds and ends that have been mentioned on other discs. Uh, a couple of Boscos, The Only Surviving Spoonie Melody, and the bawdy Christmas shorts with the Termite Terrace crew. Now, the copyright on it says 2008, but I don't remember it on Volume 6. I gotta go double-check, but I think I would have remembered. Now, the Christmas shorts, though, did appear there, but they were separately as uh, not part of the documentary. So now it's on to the cartoons. We start off with Frizz at MGM. This was from the short time in 1938-1939 when Frizz went over to the other company. Like I said, see, this is where all the mergers pay off. And he got stuck doing Cats and Jammer kids cartoons. 
Now, in the early days at Warner's and here, they credited him as Isidore. When he went back to Warner's, he kind of shortened it to I and then later on used Frizz. Now, all of these run eight or nine minutes and you feel it. First is Poultry Pirates. This is all captain and no kids. The captain battles chickens and ducks who want to attack his garden. Second is a day at the beach. The whole crew is on board here, including Mama and the old guy with the top hat. The captain has an ongoing battle with the sun and his umbrella. Otherwise, you get the waves and sandcastle gags and, you know, things like that. Uh, the captain's Christmas is next. Captain is getting ready to play Santa, but he gets sabotaged by some old sailor enemies of his. But along the way, they feel bad and give the kids a Christmas. Now, this is the only color one of the bunch. I think this one ended up on one of those TBS Christmas specials. Though most likely without all the shooting and the doll in blackface. Seal Skinners is next. The captain and his rivals try to trick and escape Seal into going with them back to the circus. Well, he just wants to go back to the South Pole. In a way, it's kind of a nebulous early version of 8-Ball Bunny. I guess just Chuck and Mike refined it a little bit. Finally, there's Mama's new hat. The boys get Mama's Mother's Day present from a horse who doesn't take too kindly about getting his hat stolen. Now, a bunch of gags here were later used in Frizz's works over at Warner Brothers. No big surprise there. Now, Freeling made four others while MGM. I mean, why didn't they just put those on as well? One of them was named The Pygmy Hunt, so I guess that speaks for itself. Now, next up is the best of the rest of Tex. This is a bunch of Tex Avery shorts that he did over at MGM. George has taken care of this and made a whole separate, beautiful-looking collection of Tex Avery cartoons. We'll deal with that at some point. These are 11 of his best at MGM. I mean, couldn't we get an even dozen? Even with that, there's still a few that could have been on. One of the Of Tomorrow shorts come immediately to mind. Most of these were the in-between cartoon in the syndicated Tom and Jerry show. In any case, let's just quickly go over what we get. First is Blitzwolf. This actually showed up on the Academy Awards collection. Tex makes a splash at MGM with his take on the three pigs as a World War II allegory with the wolf as a certain dictator. Practically an epic at almost 10 minutes in length. They leave no stone unturned. I love the non-aggression pact the wolf signed with the pigs, among many other references. Next is Red Hot Riding Hood. Somebody finally decided... Well, if these are for adults, let's really get some sex appeal in these cartoons. So before there was Jessica Rabbit. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. There was Red Hot Riding Hood. In it, the cast revolts against doing the same old story, same old way. So we get this very different version. This one is a landmark cartoon. Screwball Squirrel is next. Much like Red Hot Riding Hood, a cartoon character rebels against type and wreaks havoc. This time the crazy squirrel battles the dog and breaks many conventions along the way. Tex's attempt to create a new star didn't quite work out, but the tune and several others that Screwy starred in are pretty funny. Swing Shift Cinderella follows the semi-sequel to Red Hot Riding Hood with another fairy tale heroine strutting her stuff in front of the wolf who wanders in from the wrong picture. Like all sequels, everything is taken up a notch. If Red Hot Riding Hood was Rita Hayworth, Swing Shift Cinderella is Jane Russell. They didn't include the third film in the trilogy, Little Rural Riding Hood, possibly because this section of that tune is directly taken from this one. King Size Canary is next. A hungry cat wants to have a meal for himself, so he catches a canary and feeds him Jumbo Grow. This turns the bird into a monster, so the cat has to take the stuff himself in protection. Then a dog gets involved, then a mouse. And you can see how Tex and Heck, Alan, his main writer, come up with an idea and write it for all it's worth. Bad Luck Blackie is next. A dog, voiced by our director, pesters the little cat. He runs into a black alley cat who gives him a whistle to use if the dog bugs him so he can cross his path and give him bad luck. Then the dog gets a hold of it and paints him white. It's the usual Tex craziness, but to be honest, Idea kind of runs out of steam at the end. Next, we have a couple of tunes from... Hello, are you happy people? First is Senor Droopy. 
South of the border, Droopy battles a fellow matador for the imagined affections of actress Lena Romay. This one and the one with multiple Droopies running around chasing the bad guy were the two that I remember getting the most play on TV. The other one is Wags to Riches. Droopy is heir to a vast fortune, but Spike is next in line should he meet with an unfortunate end. So he tries to make it happen. Kind of typical Droopy and Spike. Next is Symphony in Slang. A guy shows up at the pearly gates and tells St. Peter about his life in Slang. This one's one of my all-time favorites. Darn near every single sentence is a pun that's depicted literally. Magical Maestro follows, another one of my all-time favorites. A magician is harassed by an opera singer, so he gets his revenge later on thanks to his magic wand, changing him into all kinds of different singers. Needless to say, the blackface scene gets edited down to the anvil just dropping on the singer's head. Last up is Rockabye Bear. A bear is trying to hibernate and wants a watchdog to keep things quiet. A pound dog gets the job, but another one tries to get him to make noise so he can get the job. Now, I'd never seen this one before, but it seemed to have been an internet favorite. Now, when this first came out, I thought we kind of had a reverse strife with father situation because IMDb had Dawes Butler as the voice of the dog pound proprietor, but he was doing a voice I never heard him do before. So I thought it possibly could have been Arnold Stang, but he didn't do any work with MGM. He was strictly over at uh, Famous Studios doing Hoyman and Catnip, or just Hoyman at that point. But it turns out in the subsequent 12 years since this came out, IMDb has added Pat McGeehan as not only the voice of the dog pound proprietor, but also as the bear in there. So that answers that question. Next up is a small selection of the private snafu catalog in various degrees of preservation. 25 were released, another three were planned but never made. So what's included here is exactly the same as what appeared on the Golden Collection volumes. But note to Warners, please do not put these on a Blu-ray unless you're going to make some effort to correct major issues. The gold brick is still at the wrong speed as it was on Golden Collection Volume 4, and the home front still doesn't have an intro. Now, who listens and looks at this and says, eh, yeah, go ahead, release it, it's fine. These need to be fully restored and put on its own package, or at least as many of them as they can get a hold of. Supposedly, there are some smaller labels that have done this since these are all, like, public domain, so maybe it doesn't pay for Warners to do it, but Somebody really should. So here's what's included here. I'll do them chronologically, not the way they show up on the disc. First is Coming, Snafu. It's a preview of the series, letting soldiers know what they would be in for when they watch these. Next is Gripes. Snafu complains about all the stuff he has to do, so his fairy god sergeant, technical fairy first class, shows him what it'd be like if he didn't do his duty. Hmm. I wonder if this was in the back of Frank Capra's mind when he saw The Greatest Gift short story. Hmm. There's Spies, which has Snafu learning to keep his big mouth shut or else the German and Japanese spies all around will get word of what's to come. Then there's the Goldberg, as I just mentioned. Snafu is a big lazy bum, which leads him into trouble when he has to battle the bad guys. It doesn't end well for him. Now, what, like what I just pointed out, listen to how this sounds. Couldn't someone have just popped this in an editing program and fixed the speed? You know, a whole bunch of people on YouTube have done it for them already. Here's how it should sound. Looks a whole lot better, too. In the home front, Snafu is stationed up north and wants to go back home to take it easy, but everybody in the old hometown is working hard towards the war effort. The version here is missing the Snafu opening. They probably just could have plugged it in from another version, but it's got the opening on YouTube. Not sure if someone else edited or if they got a, just a complete copy. Here's how that looks.
In rumors, Snafu hears all kind of rumors but has to keep his mouth shut. Or else, there's snafu Man, Technical Fairy First Class, grants Snafu his wish to become a superhero and take care of the enemy. But as usual, things don't quite work out. Finally, there's censored. Snafu keeps writing home to tell everybody things he shouldn't, so he ends up being censored over and over again. Now, you might recognize Technical Fairy First Class as the one from A Hitch in Time that we talked about in episode 3.5. Looks like Chuck revived them for that short. The other military-related tune is the sailor Mr. Hook, who was co-created by Dennis the Menace's creator, Hank Ketchum, to pitch war bonds to sailors. Warners did three shorts with the sailor, all directed by different people. First is the return of Mr. Hook, where our sailor tells his skeptical boatmates the benefit of buying bonds today. Namely, you'll have money for tomorrow. This was the honest-to-God first directorial effort for Robert McKimson. I know we've had some confusion over this, but this one is for sure. It's once we get to the theatrical tunes that there's an open question about it. Next is Tokyo Woes, directed by Bob Clampett. This one pokes fun at Japanese agent Tokyo Rose. And remember, this is wartime propaganda. But she can't sway Mr. Hook. He's buying his bonds no matter what. And with this in his future, who wouldn't? Finally, we have The Good Egg, directed by Chuck Jones. The two sides of Hook are in conflict over buying more war bonds. Of course, the good side wins out. Now, Warners has one of the most famous war bond pitches ever with any bonds today, featuring Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, and Elmer Fudd. The tall man with the high hat will be coming down your way. Get your savings out when you hear him shout, any bonds today. It was also performed in two of the hook shorts. Any bonds today, we'll be blessed if we all invest in the USA. So this would have been a nice addition to this set. But it's one with a problem with Bugs' Al Jolson blackface imitation. Maybe if we get a full wartime collection, we can put it there fully restored and uncut. Now the hook tunes all look like a second or third generation copy from like a reel-to-reel videotape, but they're in pretty good shape to be honest. Hook's voice was done by an actor who had a connection to the comics... Arthur Lake played Dagwood Bumstead in the Blondie films 28 times. <laughs> He's pretty good at voiceover, and he has a distinctive voice. Uh, uh. Kind of surprised he didn't do more of this, but I guess Columbia had him tied up with those Blondie pictures. Oddly enough, the first Mr. Hook cartoon was done by Walter Lance over at Universal and featured Dick Nelson as the voice of the sailor. And our war bonds not only helped win the war, but they paid for our home, our new furniture, our planes, and as a matter of fact, if it wasn't for our war bonds, you wouldn't be here. Dick Nelson, not to be confused with Frank Nelson. Mr. Yes! Or Dick Wilson. Please don't squeeze the Charmin. Finally, we have a group of odds and ends related to the Schlesinger documentary. We have the very first Warner's cartoon, Bosco the Talking Kid, where Rudolph Ising draws our new star for the very first time. But, yeah, he's definitely stereotype. Well, here I is, and I sure feel good. Is what it is. Next is the very first Looney Tunes, Sinking in the Bathtub, with Bosco singing the title song. Hey, it's 1930. People were still getting used to sound on film, so this was semi-interesting. At this point, they should have done Lady Play Your Mandolin, and as we talked about, you have to go buy the Little Caesar Blu-ray or DVD for that. Instead, they include Got Me Again, which was the first Warner's cartoon to be nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, they gave them out for cartoons this early. A very familiar-looking mouse and his friends... Have fun in a music shop, but then a cat comes in, so they have to fight back. Kind of kind of an odd story, wouldn't you say? Also included is a spoony melody for Crying in the Carolinas. Apparently they only did one of these. Finally, we have the full Termite Terrace Christmas short subject. They, uh, 
certainly kept themselves busy doing other things than cartoons now. <laughs> so let's take a look here at the actual discs. So here's the package. You got a slip cover on it, not the big box. Uh, so here's the whole set. Open it up and we've got disc one. Oops, wrong side. Disc two and disc three plus Sometimes these are hard to get out. Uh, there we go. Our nice booklet. Breakdown. All kind of nice info in there. And they even got the bonus content. Best of the rest. So it's high quality. They really went, you know, they didn't go all out like last time. You just you just have the three discs and the booklet, you know, all that. Uh, they didn't do the box with the tchotchkes and everything. Uh, now the first platinum collection had a heavy concentration of cartoons from volumes one and four of the golden collection. This time out, it looks like two and five got the most love. Again, you can find this on Amazon or eBay, you know, places like that. But I have an alternate option we'll do after I'm done with volume three. Also, as I mentioned in the February update, I decided to hold off on the boomerang rotation thing since it seems to be in a bit of flux. Uh, I have to wait and see if the ones they show this month are added into the full rotation. They did add snow business with Tweety and Sylvester kind of out of nowhere, but they didn't run it for Christmas. You know, same with gift wrapped. Didn't run it there either. But... You know, those preview sites really kind of messed up the schedules. On uh, Chinese New Year, they ran Prince Varmint, a.k.a. Prince Violent, instead of Bashful Buzzard. The other two were correct, just out of order. Uh, on Valentine's Day, they ran Porky's Romance, which was the first Petunia, instead of Porky's Double Trouble. That makes complete sense. I have no idea what Porky's Double Trouble would have done, uh, you know, with Petunia anyway. Uh, then on President's Day, they actually ended up getting one of the three right. They didn't do Old Glory. They did Napoleon Bunny Part instead. It's kind of a stretch. You know, French help with the revolution, but... Yeah. Uh, then they did Ballot Box Bunny. And then they did end up running Bunker Hill Bunny after all. Uh, I can show you a little clip from the part that I edited out right here. They're doing Bunker Hill Bunny, which, annoyingly enough, is not on Blu-ray, but it's uh, one of the best of the Bugs and Sam in a historical type place. You know, they did the one where Sam is a Roman legionnaire, Sam is a desert warrior, you know, those type. Uh, this, is, this is one of the best ones. So we'll see what shows up and what doesn't. I think I saw Hair Splitter and Nightmare Hair somewhere down the line that they may be showing up. Plus, it looks like they're going to be adding back in some of the 13th tunes. I'll explain that concept when we do the whole wrap-up. Uh, the rotation either just started over again or is going to be starting over again. I think it's starting over again towards the end of February. Uh, they're doing some crazy stuff where they're running on the weekends, like one hour from like S and then one hour from F or a half hour from the, it's. Very odd, but in, in general, you could kind of see during the week where the alphabet's going, so you go through there. Uh, quick clarification on Triple Long Daffy. Uh, as I was watching the video and heard myself say the line about this being, you know, Daffy and Porky's first time together as friends, I was like, well, wait a minute, what about TikTok Tucker, you know, um, and all those black and white Daffy and Porky's, they were kind of friendly there. So let me define the point a little bit better. This was the first time they were like allies after Daffy became the bigger star. You know, now they, they still had the ones where they were opposed to one another. You know, think McKimson, you know, boobs in the woods, full coverage, a thump fun, time to retire, all those. But, you know, just wanted to get that point straight. You know, you know me, always want to get it right if something's a little iffy. Finally, I wanted to thank Anthony from Anthony's Animation Talk for dropping by one of the videos and leaving a comment and giving a thumbs up. 
Uh, like I said back in episode one, if you want to go in depth into any of these cartoons individually, have a look at his channel. I mean, I do a minute, minute and a half tops on any of these. He'll do 10, 20, sometimes I think there's one like close to 30 minutes on them. And he does a lot of the technical stuff I don't necessarily go into. Um, I just watched his volume two review um, and it turns out we have sort of a similar conclusion about the Collector's Choice volumes uh, that I'll talk about next episode since we'll be doing a Collector's Choice volume then. So once again, thanks to him. Oh, and let me do my Columbo. Oh, one more thing, ma'am. Um, I'll hold off on giving you a numbers update this month. Uh, things are going well. I like what I'm seeing. Just I'll let it build up a little bit so as not to bore you with the numbers. So, again, thanks, everyone, for watching. See you next month with a new disc again. Next time, it's Collector's Choice Volume 3 with more one-shots, a lot more Bugs Bunny, and more Daffy, including Mexican Joyride. I'm John Hartar. Thanks for watching.